Hello, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to this session on idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Your hosts for tonight are Hydrocephalus Canada, Association de Spina Bifida et de Hydrocephaly du Quebec, and the American Hydrocephalus Association. I'm Shauna Bodway, the Director of Programs and Information at Hydrocephalus Canada. Joining me as moderators for tonight's session are Lakeisha Harris from Hydrocephalus Canada, Margot Raganu from Margot Raganu, sorry, and Laurence Lessier from Association de Spina Bifida et de Hydrocephalus de Quebec. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Mark Hamilton will not be presenting tonight, but we are very fortunate to have Dr. Jefferson, Jefferson Chen presenting and leading the discussion. And I apologize, I'm dealing with a bit of a cold today. So um, if I start coughing, I, I apologize very much. So um, please note as well that Dr. Chen will take questions following his presentation, but he cannot provide medical advice or comments on specific cases, situations, or provide a consultation during this session. All questions asked will be answered in general terms. Please also note that the speaker is not recommending any specific course of treatment we strongly advise that you always speak with your healthcare provider about any course of treatment to ensure it is right for you. We are extremely delighted and grateful to have veteran neurosurgeon, Dr. Jefferson Chen joining us this evening. Dr. Jefferson W. Chen is a board certified UCI health neurosurgeon who specializes in neurosurgery, neurocritical care and neuro-oncology. Dr. Chen is clinical professor and vice chairman, director of the CAST Neurocritical Care Fellowship and director of neurotrauma in the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Chen's clinical interests include normal pressure hydrocephalus, brain tumors, stroke and stroke recovery and traumatic brain injury. Let's welcome Dr. Chen to begin his presentation. Thank you, Shauna, very much for that introduction and, and looking all that information up about me. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Well, um, today we're going to talk about some of the challenges of getting to a neurosurgeon and getting a shunt. All right. And Dr. Hamilton and I spoke about this, and we actually had a plan uh, to sort of discuss the differences between U.S. and Canada in particular knowing that there are some differences in healthcare systems and sometimes those differences help in getting the patient to treatment and sometimes those differences hinder or slow down the treatment. And we'll talk about that. Um, most of my perspective is from the US side because uh, that's where my practice is. Uh, we have many of my patients here on, on this Zoom meeting. Uh, this is a special meeting that we designed uh, with the Canada group, and, and uh, this is really innovative and, and novel, and we're very, very happy with it. Unfortunately, again, Dr. Hamilton was not able to make it. I know Dr. Hamilton now for over 30 years. We were actually both fellows together. Well, he was just a year ahead of me at the Barrow Neurological Institute back in the 1990s. So in a disclosure statement, there, I have no financial relationships okay, to anything that we're talking about. And let us review sort of NPH and what is NPH. So some of this, again, is, is basic. I know many of you have seen it, but it, it always doesn't hurt to, re, to refresh our memories. And if you look at it, NPH was a type of dementia that was described in 1965. All right, so that is, um, you know, uh, over 50 years, nearly 50 years ago. And it was described before CAT scans, it was described before MRI scans. So keep that in mind, it was described as a clinical entity and it represents about 5% of all dementia. And one of the hallmarks pathologically and radiographically that there's dilatation of the ventricles of the brain. We'll talk a bit more about that. Why is it called normal pressure? People always ask me that, well, why, why is it normal? Uh, and really normal pressure refers to the pressure that the brain is seeing. 
And when you measure it with a spinal tap, which many of you have had, that pressure is normal in the sense that it's less than 20 centimeters. What we know, and the studies show from all the head injury studies, is that if the pressure is greater than 20, statistically, patients don't do as well. That's why it is believed that if the pressure is less than 20, they are not the sequela of neuronal death or uh, degeneration. This primarily affects patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. There are estimates that there are about one in 200 patients over the age of 60 or 70 will have this. And we've done some estimates in Orange County alone where there are about 10,000 people who are estimated to have this. Now, clearly in Orange County, I'm not seeing that many people with NPH. And those who are in our Orange County support group, which is what started all this, uh, know that they're not seeing 10,000 people at our meeting. So why is that? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. A lot of that has to do with the diagnosis of NPH and really um, sort of clarifying you know, all the symptoms and realizing that there are other entities, other disease states, other neurological diseases which can mimic or overlap with NPH. In the US alone, there's estimated about 500, 700,000 people who have this, and once again, the peak incidence is in the sixth or seventh decades. Anecdotally, uh, I will point out that many of my patients show up in their right around 80. It seems that around 80 is when, when uh, many of the symptoms become such that they're intolerable. And when you talk to the patients, well, you realize that this may have been going on for a while during their 70s, uh, particularly three to five years before. And what this tells us that as many patients don't realize uh, this process is going on, they attribute it to old age. And that points out again that NPH is progressive and insidious and slow in nature. Now, is that always the case? Well, what we're realizing uh, in, at least in my patients, is that there are many things that will bring on the symptoms of NPH sooner so that the patient may have had NPH all along and there is a stressor, for example, a head injury, a fall, a COVID infection uh, that may sort of trigger the symptoms uh, onset a bit sooner and actually more acutely than this insidious nature. But many times, even those patients would go back and talk to the patients of the family and realize that uh, this has been going on for a while. All right. Now, what are these symptoms that we're talking about? This is the classic triad, what's called Hakim's triad, which is named after one of the discoverers of NPH. And one of the most prominent ones is gait. And gait is described as an unbalanced, um, a slowness of gait. Uh, patients describe to me frequently that they're like walking on a boat or their feet are just slow to move and they're glued to the deck. Now, what this leads to is that the patient's movements are not that efficient. So their walking is not efficient and they sometimes complain of, of tiredness or feeling fatigued because really their, their, their movements are not efficient. With respect to dementia, which is another part of that triad, there's an overall slowing of the thought processes. Uh, patients describe that they're not able to focus as well. They have difficulty with decision-making, difficulty completing tasks. One of the things I always ask the patients is whether they have any particular hobbies and do they still do that hobbies? For example, we have patients who were you know, avid musicians who can't do that anymore, who, who or avid readers who don't read anymore because they can't focus and concentrate. A simple thing is to ask them whether they do crossword puzzles. And many patients say that they used to do crossword puzzles, but now can't really complete them. So these are some of the subtle things that you have to ask uh, and probe 
uh, in the history. So once again, I'm pointing out here is that uh, it's an imperative that the physicians spend time uh, with the patient and talk to them and their families to get some of these detailed history. With respect to urinary incontinence, this describes as loss of bladder control. Uh, this tends to appear somewhat later in the disease and it uh, may uh, manifest um, uh, differently. Uh, hang on. There's some uh, there's some people who are trying to get into the meeting who, who uh, I guess, try to uh, uh, go to the old the old site. So hopefully um, they'll figure it out. Um, okay. Now, the patients um, have radiographic uh, stigmata of this. Okay, so they have radiographic stigmata and. This is one of the key uh, stigmata, which is the finding that their ventricles are bigger. And when you look at this, you can see, and I, I, can, I can see my mouse here, that these patients have large ventricles. And this I've delineated here is red. That's sort of the normal boundaries that you would expect uh, of the ventricles. So they clearly have large ventricles, right? And um, so this uh, is one of the key findings uh, that we see in these patients. The gait problems uh, oftentimes uh, are the most frequent because that's, that's the external uh, stigmata that you're going to see. They're going to complain. They have trouble walking and they have trouble with their balance. Uh, that is sort of the external stigmata. Uh, with bladder function, sometimes it's hard to tell because there are things that mimic it. Often, patients don't like to talk about bladder control. All right, so that is uh, another factor. That is, it is it is something that many times patients will are a little embarrassed about, which is understandable, and they want to hide it. And um, so, uh, sometimes these don't come uh, to light as as quickly. Now, uh, oftentimes patients don't have equal, you know, gait problems or equal memory problems or, or equal uh, problems with bladder control. Usually, it there's one uh, symptom that that predominates or shows up first. So, pathway to a diagnosis. How do we make this diagnosis? Right. Uh, most patients, at least in the U.S., uh, present first to the primary care physicians with complaints. Now, one of the problems is many times the primary care physician may not really recognize all the subtleties of this, right? And, and they may attribute this to Alzheimer's disease. And they may go down the pathway of trials of different medications for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, why is that? Well, Alzheimer's disease is your most common cause of dementia, right? And many times patients who have just a bit of dementia or some cognitive problems or mild cognitive uh, impairment, uh, that the primary care physician will say, well, this is Alzheimer's disease and head them down that pathway. Why don't they go to a neurologist? Well, there are neurologists around who specialize in Alzheimer's disease, uh, but they are, at least here in the U.S., few uh, and far between, and they oftentimes have a large uh, backup uh, to see them. Gate problems, again, there, there are other entities that uh, mimic gate problems, and frequently they'll be referred to a movement specialist for considerations of Parkinson's disease, which is one of the uh, neurological entities that has gate problems, which sometimes is similar and may overlap with the gait uh, characteristics we see in NPH. Now, gait and balance problems. I have many patients come to me from the ENT service because they complain of balance problems or dizziness, they describe it. And I always ask them, is it true dizziness where the world is spinning around you or is it just an imbalance? Uh, 
that is, is causing the problem, okay? Um, so because there is overlap, because sometimes there's other entities, um, we sometimes uh, have difficulty. And that's why there are ancillary tests that are, are done or are recommended to help with making the diagnosis. What are these ancillary tests? One of the ancillary tests that we do is what's called a MRI CSF flow study. And what this is, is a special MRI scan that looks at the flow of the fluid going through this area here, what's called the aqueduct. And it can actually measure and give us a number to say, is this abnormal? And what we know is that in the patients with NPH, frequently, there is some impedance here, okay? And there are theories around, and, and again, we don't really know what causes NPH, but there's some people who believe that because there's impedance or slowness of the fluid going through that over time, that backup of fluid or that pushing, or trying to squeeze that fluid through there leads to the dilatation of the ventricles, right? And so this is one screening tool that we use. Another screening tool is a spinal tap. And many of may have, you have had that. And the spinal tap does two things. It gives you an opening pressure to see what the pressure is that we talked about. The other thing that it does is it uh, tells you uh, whether or not the patient might get better. How does it do that? Well, if you take off a good volume of spinal fluid and then have the patient walk afterwards, um, if they have dramatic improvement, uh, that is a good sign. Excuse me. To extend this a bit further is there are many centers where we'll do a three-day lumbar drain test where the patient will have a lumbar drain in their back and they drain off you know, 20 to 30 cc's each hour, sort of mimicking what a shunt would do. So this would lead to the, uh, constant decompression over three days and they have formal neurological test, PTOT, to see if there's improvement. Uh, this is uh, sort of the gold standard and has, uh, and I, I know Dr. Hamilton's participated in some of the studies with this that have demonstrated its efficacy. Uh, the difficulty with this is hard to do. Uh, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Uh, patients who are older and infirm don't like it because it hurts. Finally, Detailed neurological, neuropsychological tests can be done to sort of pinpoint and get a better idea of the memory problems. And what this does is there are certain memory patterns that certain of the disorders have, for example, Parkinson's disease versus Alzheimer's disease versus frontal temporal dementia versus NPH. There may be different patterns in the neuropsychological uh, diseases. Now, so that is all the ways to sort of get to a diagnosis, all right? Once you get to a diagnosis, the next part is getting to a neurosurgeon. And there's different ways uh, that patients get to a neurosurgeon. Many of them come through primary care. Many of them come through neurologists. Many of them come through uh, ENT, for example, just as I mentioned. There are some places in the United States, for example, where there are centers where they specialize in NPH, uh, and they have neurologists, PT, OT, everybody who will see the patient up front and screen them and evaluate them and then send them to a neurologist. Uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Williams is somebody who's done a lot of that at University of Washington in Seattle, and I think the Hopkins group also has uh, such a center. Uh, at UC Irvine, we don't have that. Uh, type of center, although we're forming that, and we have certain neurologists who will refer patients to me, or certain primary care physicians who sort of are tuned into this and, and know about this. Now, getting to a neurosurgeon sometimes is difficult because there's a stigma to neurosurgery. Uh, people don't necessarily want to have surgery, particularly on the brain. Here are some of the arguments that I've, I've heard over time, patients too old. Well, that's not necessarily the issue. It's, it's the overall medical condition of the patient that is key. Sometimes patients as they're older have many medical uh, issues. For example, patients who are on uh, Plavix 
or eloquence are at increased risk with the surgery because of potential bleeding. However, we've learned to deal with that and have worked out ways to stop those medications for X amount of time before and afterwards. Our anesthesiologists and medical teams are very sophisticated at this point and have learned to uh, help us with the surgeries to make it safe. Sometimes they argue that VP shut doesn't help. There are a whole uh, body of literature, particularly from certain neurologists who feel that uh, the shunt doesn't help, and, and this is, uh, and that is just temporizing, and that what we're seeing is a neurodegenerative process that is ongoing, and uh, the shunt is just temporizing. However, we all know, and many of you who are uh, members of the support group have uh, personal uh, experience that it does help. Sometimes we argue that it's too late, and this is one of the uh, arguments that time is important, early intervention, early diagnosis is important. Because again, if the patient is already in a wheelchair or bed bound, then we know that uh, the outcome is not as good. The surgery is too long. Uh, in generally, the surgery takes about two hours. So it's not a long involved surgery. And that two hours is not necessarily all surgery time. That's sort of the anesthesia time, setting up uh, and uh, getting out of the room. Many people are afraid of a long hospital stay. In most of our situations, most patients said, uh, go home over the next day or two. Uh, other arguments, the uh, surgery is brain surgery, therefore is complex. Again, that's sort of the stigma of neurosurgery. Uh, at this point, this is fairly routine. We've developed nice methods and methodology to do this. Uh, there's also the belief that these are prone to failure, prone to complications. I think much of that literature about shunts comes from the pediatric population, where many of these people that you see at some of their meetings will say, well, I've had you know, 20 shunt surgeries done in the last, whatever, five years or so. With NPH, with the newer shunt materials, newer ways to do this make this much less likely uh, so that there'll be fewer revisions. And again, Yes, it is brain surgery. Just a little bit about the shunt and some of the things we do to make it more safe. This is where the shunt's going to go into here. All right. Some people put the shunts up here. Some people put them posteriorly. I think uh, it sort of depends on the surgeon's preference. Uh, but again, you drill a hole and the tube goes in here. And the shunt is has this program on it that can be used to change the pressure of the shunt. Again, this shows the two different approaches here in the front versus going here in the back. I think one of the advantages of having up front is it's accessible uh, and you're not laying on it. The disadvantage is, is that if you're bald, it tends to be a bit more visible. There are many new ad junks that we use to help us get the tube into the ideal place. You can say, well, these ventricles are so big, you should be able to uh, hit them without any problems. However, where you put the catheter can make a difference as far as this long-term patency. For example, if it's too close to the wall, it has a higher chance of uh, getting plugged up and occluding. Uh, if it goes across the other side, it can sometimes uh, get stuck on this septum here that's in the middle. So there are, there are tools that we use, navigation tools, which is really a GPS system, or using intraoperative ultrasound. Either of those can help you ideally place the catheter to decrease the chance of it failing. We use, I, I use laparoscopic techniques and work with our general surgeons. They've gotten really good at doing laparoscopic techniques. This is the same type of techniques they use for gallbladders or that they use for appendicitis, uh, where they can go in, um, they can uh, inflate the abdomen, so there's a lot of room there. These are smaller incisions, and it helps us to place the catheter sort of an ideal place so it doesn't get tangled up uh, or in areas of adhesions. So we work with our general surgeons, and this is another way to help. It also improves and decreases the abdominal pain, so the patients tend to go home pretty quickly from this. One of the things that I want to touch on is sort of the importance of advocacy, which is why I think all of you are here. Uh, I think 
it is important to improve the recognition of NPH and the awareness of ways to improve the diagnosis, uh, awareness that surgery can be transformative in the proper patient, and that many times the stigma of having surgery is not necessarily warranted. And a surgery can be done safely uh, in the elderly population. And I think that the, our anesthesiologists, our surgeons have gotten really good at doing these safely. And we have new technologies and ways to optimize the medical condition of the patient. And also, we need to acknowledge that there's a lot that we do not know. Okay, we honestly do not know what causes idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. And I say idiopathic because we don't have a cause for that. Secondary NPH, which is a whole different topic, may occur after head injury, it may occur after infections, it may occur after meningitis, it may occur after stroke. That's a different type of NPH. Uh, but we're talking about the idiopathic form where there's no uh, traceable etiology. And so uh, that's where research is so important. I know that Dr. Hamilton and his group are very uh, involved with research. Uh, Dr. Hamilton has headed up the uh, adult hydrocephalus initiative uh, that is across the country, where they have many studies that are ongoing. Some of you may even be involved in some of those studies that are ongoing across the country uh, to try to find better ways both to diagnose and to treat NPH. I think support groups are important uh, because I think that uh, at least we, our experience in our support groups is that there's a lot of uh, interest and enthusiasm and advocacy uh, because many patients don't want other people to either suffer long delays or, or suffer the wrong diagnosis. Uh, and so I think that the uh, support groups are important uh, because you know, many of you are people who have had similar uh, experiences. And so once again, I think it's important to go out and advocate, uh, to, to get knowledge out there, to uh, contribute to research, to, to participate in research studies. This is just uh, a summary of our, our support group that we have been doing now for about a year and a half. Uh, Zoom has really transformed how we do the support groups. We used to meet in person and we'd get about maybe maybe 15 people. Uh, and yes, we had more face-to-face -face time and had food and, and time together. But I think ever since we've gone to Zoom, we've had a lot more uh, activity and, uh, and participation. I think that uh, Zoom will bring the uh, meetings and the opportunities to interact right to your computer. So I thank you for your attention and we can now turn to uh, discussions and questions. So um, one of the first questions is, what are the differences between ventriculo megaly and INPH? They're really uh, the same. Okay, ventriculo megaly just means big ventricles. All right, so it's, it's, it is a radiographic term. So when you talk about you have ventriculo megaly, that's it's the picture I showed you. Your ventricles are bigger than normal. INPH is the whole diagnosis, okay? Because not everybody who has ventricular megaly will have all the symptoms, okay? So, so ventricular megaly is part of INPH. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this next question um, is about ETV versus shunts. Um, how much success have you had with ETV surgery for IMTH compared to shunt surgery? So what is ETV surgery? So this endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So somebody has been doing a lot of reading uh, on the internet. And what that is, is really you are poking a hole, just for people who don't know, inside the brain internally. So you're basically finding another pathway for the spinal fluid to flow, all right? And what um, and, and the theory is that if there's some impedance of the flow going through the brain, like I showed on the MRI CSF flow studies, you're finding a different pathway so it doesn't have to try to squeeze through there. 
And I will have to say, I have not had very good experience with that uh, because I think that uh, there's a high failure rate. Okay, unless the aqueduct is really, really blocked and there's like no fluid going through there, uh, it generally, uh, I have found that um, it lasts for a little bit and then the patients then revert to a shunt. And again, shunt. there's different theories. People uh, look at it differently. People screen them differently. But in my personal experience, I have, um, you know, had not had that good experience as far as um, uh, not reverting to a shunt. Okay. <laughs> Again, my apologies, everyone. This cold is kicking my butt today. Um, next question. For those who are not a candidate for surgery, are there any therapies that can help with mobility issues? I think starting with physical therapy and gait training is sort of, is sort of important. And I think that there are many patients who start to notice that they're they're having problems with their gait and balance. They're more unsteady. And those patients who are sort of not ready for surgery yet, okay, they, they, they for whatever reason, don't want to have surgery just yet, or they're afraid of surgery, or, or they don't think they're that bad. Gait training, physical therapy, helping them with their movements uh, really does help and may avert or attenuate the process of um, uh, the decline. In your experience, um, do neurosurgeons typically want to wait to do NPH surgery to see if there's an improvement if a person does have therapy? Or do you just recommend having the, the surgery? It really depends how debilitating, where they are in their walk, right? Are they, are they like now using a walker? Uh, are they using a cane? Are they just having a little bit instability? And, and it really depends on the patient too. There are some patients who say that, you know, you know, I can't walk as fast. It really, it really slows me down. This is life. This is really affecting their life. I can't play golf anymore. Okay. Um, and they, they want to have surgery. And, and so it's, a, it's an individual discussion you have with the patient. I have patients who, who, you know, because they couldn't play golf before, um, they want the surgery and then they, they able to play golf afterward. And that is a major, you know, incentive for them. Okay. Uh, next question, are there any drug therapies available rather than surgery? Uh, at this point in time, uh, there are not. Um, some patients talk about Diamox, which is a drug that tries to make the, the brain make less spinal fluid. Uh, and so, but the problem with that is you sort of reach a new equilibrium. Your body still has to absorb whatever you make. Um, so it doesn't always work, but it may sort of attenuate some of the symptomatology. And also you have to be careful because there are electrolyte abnormalities that can occur. Okay. Um, next question. Does NPH get worse over time? And is there anything available to slow it down without surgery? Um, the natural history of NPH is that it gets worse over time. Okay. That again, is progressive. It's a progressive neurological or neurodegenerative uh, problem that gets worse. And and patients may start out with gait, then, then they start having problems with their memory, and they start having problems with their bladder control. So uh, the natural history is that it gets worse. There are things you can do to attenuate that, like any type of neurological disorder, walking, uh, exercising, uh, memory exercises all can help. Okay. And then we'll go to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, the first question is, if you have a shunt on, on either side, whichever side it's on, um, could that affect the ear and the eye on that side? It's not supposed to. It shouldn't. Uh, because, sure. again, uh, uh, the ventricles are in continuity with each other, so it's not draining more one side than the other. So it really, it really should. Next question: Do the urinary symptoms subside after surgery? They can subside. Yes, yes, they can. Um, and again, it's different degrees of symptomatology. And don't forget, urinary problems are sometimes hard to. To really pin down, 
there are other causes of urinary, urinary problems too. For example, many men at that age have prostate disease, which can affect urinary problems. Women who've had children can have stress incontinence that can affect this. So there's other things that contribute to it. Um, but uh, in general, urinary symptoms uh, can improve. Okay. Can hand tremors be associated with MGH? In general, they are not. That's usually some other type of um, uh, neurological or neurodegenerative problem. And if a tremor is present, does that delete the possibility of it being NPH? It does not. You can have more than one. You can have more than one problem going on. Just even, for example, essential tremor. Can a patient can have an essential tremor, which you know, which we're not actually sure what causes that, but they can have an essential tremor and they can have NPH. And would that include ataxia as well? Um, not exactly. Ataxia is more just the whole gait problem. So that's more of a, a, a gait instability. Sorry, could NPH be a genetic condition? And is there any research on this in process? Uh, yeah, that is a very good question. Um, there are some reports in the literature of families or siblings that have both have NPH, uh, uh, but those are, those are sort of case reports. They're very few. I think in my experience, my patients in Orange County, I, I can identify like two families who've had either, you know, parent and child or siblings who who both have MPH and had had a shunt. There are studies going on um, on this. We are we actually have a genetic study where we're um, and some of my patients have been part of this uh, study where we've collected DNA. Uh, from the cheek swab and sequence the whole um, exome looking for commonalities uh, for commonalities to try to find an underlying genetic cause. So yes, people are doing studies. Awesome. That's what we like to hear. Lots of research. And we know that the Hydrocephalus Association in the U.S. is leading the way. And the next question, <laughs> sorry, the next question is about someone who has been diagnosed about two and a half years ago and has a VP shunt. Um, she's been doing really well, went on a plane trip, and afterwards, she experienced severe headache and hearing loss on the descent. Could that be something to do with the hydrocephalus, or is this something completely different? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, hearing loss, you know, we all get that when you get in an airplane. I mean, that's that's not uncommon. You know, you get your ears are popping, you can't hear anything. Um, so that that can be explained just by that. Um, can that lead to headaches? Well, the pressure changes because yes, there are pressure changes going on that we all experience, and there are people who, without shunts, have headaches with that mm -hmm. change, and it may just be exacerbated, um, or or with hydrocephalus, you're just maybe more sensitive to it. So yes, it is possible. Would, excuse me. Would being on the, the, with the descent of the plane, and I'm just throwing this out here, with the descent or the takeoff, um, is it possible to cause any damage to the shunt or change the settings? No, no, it shouldn't no. change the settings. I mean, most of these settings are, you know, pretty fixed and you know, like only the magnet will change them, at least this day and age. So it shouldn't change that. Um, and so I, I don't think that the, it's a problem with the shunt itself. It's just sort of the whole physiology that the brain is sensitive to. Correct. Um, I know I just traveled from uh, on a plane and on the descent into Toronto, my ears were screaming at me. Um, yeah, that could be very painful. It, yes. So it, it happens with or without shunt um, for sure. What percentage of patients need a second shunt or have complications with the first one? And what is the most typical complication? Okay, so um, what percentage of patients with NPH um, need a, a second shunt? Uh, again, I think uh, that number is, is pretty rare. 
Okay, the number's pretty rare. And what will happen is it's usually if the shunt plugs up, it fails, it breaks, uh, or does or stops working. Okay. And so uh, that number is is fairly rare. And again, part of it is is we're dealing with, you know, realistically we're dealing with an older population, people who are in the seventies or eighties. Uh, and so you may not notice a shunt problem for 20 years, but most of these shunts are designed to, they work for at least 10 years. Um, and so, you know, we don't necessarily know when people start living to hundreds and, and 110, that we may have more problems. Uh, as far as complications with shunts, uh, infection and bleeding, uh, probably about 5% risk sort of from the get-go when you put them in, that's what's quoted in the literature. And again, you have to look at the adult literature, not the pediatric literature, right? Uh, and sometimes they're mixed. And so you need to focus on the adult literature for specifically for NPH. I think Dr. Hamilton has, has some papers on that. And as far as complications, one of the complications is down the line getting a subdural hematoma. If the shunt happens to drain too much or if the patient bumps their head, they're very susceptible to getting fluid or blood on the outside of the brain. Interesting. So this is, <laughs> excuse me, a question about COVID. How much was COVID a factor in delay of diagnosis? Uh, I think that in delay of diagnosis, I think, you know, if you think about it, people didn't go to the doctors as much. People stayed home. Uh, people didn't go seek uh, medical attention because of COVID in general. So I think that many things uh, were were delayed um, simply because people weren't going out. People weren't going to the doctor's um, complaints. So I think it was a factor, just like we were seeing that for people who had diabetes, people who had cancer, that it was a delay because of um, you know people not wanting to go to the hospitals or not wanting to go uh, seek medical attention. I would agree on that. And also the backlog um, Correct. that COVID, you know, put on the hospital staff is uh, definitely an issue too. And and I think the thing to point out um, to the audience is uh, we're not done with COVID. Okay. COVID is back and um, we have another season of it. So be particularly careful and the, remember that patients who have a neurological illness, like NPH, are more susceptible to the effects of COVID. So, so it would be more profound. And so I think it's particularly important to uh, wear your masks, avoid crowds, and do all the things to be careful. Would you recommend getting an, another dose of the vaccine? I'm getting mine tomorrow. Wonderful. <laughs> so this question is about <clears throat> um, the VP shunt, a programmable VP shunt. Um, if it has been, um, what's, what's the word I want to, um, if the neurosurgeon has adjusted it as much as possible and the individual is still showing symptoms that he had before, um, what does that mean? Well, a couple things. Um, you want to make sure the shunt is working and patent. So that's the first thing. Because shunts fail, they plug up. Okay. So the first thing is just to make sure the shunt really is patent and flowing. All right. Um, so that's one thing. You make sure there's no other problem. You haven't developed a subdural hematoma or something else. Uh, and then you got to sort of look at, you know, was the diagnosis correct, right? And we, we've all, you know, you know, made the wrong diagnosis or, or thought the patient really had NPH and was going to respond, but they didn't. And then you look at your objective data, right? Because I think many times patients think they're not better, okay, or they're not as good as they want to be, right? Um, but objectively, when you look from the outside, the family see that they're better, all right? And, and look for the objective data. And that's where things like gait analysis come in, okay? And I always time my patients. I make them walk 10 meters and, and time them. 
there are other measures we have to look to try to see if there's any change sort of in the dynamics of, for example, their thinking. And so doing detailed neuropsychological tests before and afterwards, it gives you a measure of, of um, you know, is there some improvement at all? And that's where we look for uh, some objective data. And we still have a lot of questions and we only have four minutes left. So I'm gonna try and run through these very quickly. Um, how long after surgery should you notice a difference in your symptoms? And how long does it take for cognition to improve after shunt surgery? So um, you may notice within the first couple of weeks. Okay, and again, it depends where the, where your surgeon sets the shunt. They set it high, they set it low, they set it middle, middle of the road. I usually set mine sort of a little bit on the high side because I'm very worried about subdural hematomas. So they may not get the benefit right away, but that's why you follow up with your neurosurgeon and adjust it appropriately. So it's really within the first probably month to two months that you start to see some indication of improvement. Uh, what was the other question? Um, I think you answered it too. It was about um, cognition and when you should see an improvement in cognition after shunt surgery. Cognition drags behind because cognition is the hardest thing to fix. Um, but if you look at studies, they say that, you know, by two years, this is the Hopkins study from years ago, about 66% of patients are clearly better cognitively. And we have two questions about um, the fluid released into the abdo abdominal cavity. Basically the same question, um, asking about irritation or it causing pain in the ab abdomen. It's, it's rare. Typical. It's rare, uh, but as the catheter floats around in there, it may, may hit a nerve or something like that. And patients may feel a fleeting, transient uh, pain. That is not unusual, uh, and it's rare that you have to do anything about that. Usually, you just move around so the, the belly is moving constantly, so it moves elsewhere. I know in, in patients who have had hydrocephalus for a long time and have been shunted for a long time, there's sometimes the tube can attach to like scar tissue and they abdomen correct it can that that would cause pain particularly if they've had previous other surgeries there's scar there and uh, it can get stuck in that and that can lead to pain and you answered the question about um covid without surgery how quickly do you see the symptoms usually progress again it's a slow process like i said it's over a couple years um, barring any, you know, other thing going on, like a head injury or a COVID infection. Do this one as the last question. Um, what are the different types of shunts that are typically used for NBH treatment? Um, there's basically programmable shunts versus non-programmable shunts. Programmable shunts, you can adjust the level, okay, say, you know, drain at a certain pressure. Non-programmable shunts are usually high, medium, low. Um, so those are the those are the basic uh, types of shunts uh, that are out there. And I could go longer, mm -hmm. Sean, if you want to go a couple of um, We'll really take two more questions and, that, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, is there an age that would be too old to have the surgery? And would a prior condition such as dementia be a reason not to recommend having the surgery? Uh, it depends on the patient and how bad the dementia is. And it also depends on their medical condition. You know, a 90-year-old that is very, very good and healthy can have surgery. But you just have to realize that there are absolutely increased risks uh, with, with surgery. There's a, a few people that who, who have been diagnosed at, say, like four or five years ago, but still have not been treated. Um, is there still... What, my one question would be, why weren't they offered surgery? And then my second question would be, um, how much of an improvement would you see that far along, say from the age of 39 to now 44 and not treated? Yeah, it's a tough question. And again, um, if it's, they're 39 and 44, that is probably not NPH. It's probably something else. And there was probably a reason um, you know, that, that it wasn't true. Um, 
somebody's asking about lifespan with NPH. Um, yes. NPH in and of itself does not shorten a person's lifespan. How it will shorten the lifespan is if you fall, hurt your head, break a hip, um, or get a urinary tract infection. Uh, that's how it shortens the person's life. Um, it's the sequela of the NPH um, that will shorten their life. Or, you know, dementia that causes them to walk in front of a car. I mean, those are the things that will shorten their life. But in and of itself, the NPH does not. This is, I guess, a, a preference for you, this question. Um, would you use a programmable shunt over a non-programmable shunt? I think that depends more on the in the patient, right? And what you're seeing? Correct. I mean, for NPH in an older patient, I always use a programmable shunt. I think um, it has revolutionized how we treat NPH. I mean, I've, I've done this now for 30 years. I remember when we had non-programmable shunts and frequently we picked the wrong, the wrong level. And plus, okay. if you try to, if, if a patient's developing signs of a subdural hematoma, you can adjust the shunt to try to avert that so they don't need to have surgery. And one last question. This is related to apathy and mood. Um, if a person wasn't shunted for several years, could that lead to irreversible brain damage? Yes, it can. Um, I think with anything that's long-term, it can. All right. Thank you, everybody. And Thanks, um, everyone.